here we are at a really difficult moment, key moment in American history. We've come after four years of very difficult politics in our country. We're seeing deepening polarization, that's identity-based polarization. The painful reality of structural racism and inequality is more evident to more and more people. And we're finding ourselves dealing with so many profound challenges that just make change seemingly difficult for many people. And yet if there's one thing I've learned over 30 years of working around the world and countries where people are trying to move from longstanding conflict to peace or from a dictatorship to democracy or to manage that process of reconciliation is that not only is change possible and it takes time, but it is possible that you can actually reach across and imagine change from those that you're opposed to, to your adversaries on the other side, to people who benefit from the systems and structures that you're seeking to change and eradicate. So as we see this growing awareness here in the United States, we're seeing people come together more and more to build relationships, to build partnerships, to build allies. Because structural racism, structural injustice, and even structural polarization will not change on its own. There's no algorithm to change that. Goodwill and hope won't change that. It requires human agency, the agency to believe that you can come together to break down these, these barriers. As Robert F. Kennedy said in South Africa in 1966, that these ripples of hope and currents come together to knock down the mightiest walls of oppression. But what did we also learn in the last 30 years of work that I and my colleagues have done at Beyond Conflict? That that transformative change, that belief that transformative change can happen, that human agency is central to this, requires a belief in your capacity to change, but equally a belief in that others across those divides can change and be partners as well. That is really key, and I think it's an important lesson for us here at this moment in the United States. So in the last 30 years, Beyond Conflict has worked in dozens of countries. And what we did is we brought in this model of shared experience, meaning we brought in people who sat across profound divides in one country after another, and who never imagined in their own settings that they could end apartheid, negotiate a peace agreement in El Salvador or Northern Ireland, or make peace with their enemies or even try to reconcile their country. And we would bring in those people from other countries who became a model for what that change would look like. We used to joke that we were like a big support group on wheels. We brought in people who've been there, know how difficult this is, struggled through it, and found their capacity and their belief in the capacity of others to be partners for transformative change. And so in country after country, we would consistently bring in these individuals and leaders to reinforce this. And so there are some really powerful examples that I want to mention. So one of them is a man named David Irvine, who unfortunately is no longer with us. But David was a Protestant paramilitary leader who tells the story that when he was 16 years old, living in Belfast, an IRA bomb killed another David Irvine of the same name, who he didn't know. And he and his colleagues were so outraged, they were teenagers, that they felt that they had to organize to defend their community. And their argument was, a good defense required an offense. That we had to protect our community and take it to them because they threatened everything we stood for. And what David found, spent 10 years in prison for terrorist activities and bomb making, he said that we learned Irish in the prison so we could understand what the IRA were prisoners were saying across the wall. And what we came to realize as we listened to their conversations we actually had more in common with them than the people who were instigating us to the violence. That they too suffered exclusion, humiliation, a sense of rejection, and loss and fear. And then he also came to realize that they would justify the violence in their communities, not only protection, but also as protecting what was core to them, what was sacred to them. 
their identity as Protestants, and their identity as British subjects. But he said, we also came to realize that we could only protect what was sacred to us when we recognize what was sacred to those across the divide. And then we found a way forward to build those partnerships for change. Rolf Meyer from South Africa was the key negotiator in the talks to end apartheid. He was instrumental in Mandela being released. And he describes his change when he was Minister of Interior, Minister of Defense under apartheid, he came to realize that apartheid was corrupt and had to end. But he also realized not only did he need to find partners within the African community and government, but across the divide in the African National Congress and others. And he tells a story of when he was minister and they were interrogating a young ANC combatant. He asked him, why did you join the armed wing of the ANC? And this young man said, you know, when I was a child, my family worked really as indentured servants to a farmer out in the countryside. And when I was about 12, 11, I was in the back of this pickup truck with the farmer, with his dog. And then a monsoon rain came and we were being drenched. And the driver of the farmer pulled over, got out, but took the dog out of the back seat and left me there. And at that moment, Rolf, he said, I was sh shaken to my core. How could this African farmer show more empathy for this dog than for this young child? And it shook him so much to his core that he said, I trembled for days and wondered, what is it about the system I grew up in and defend and benefit from would allow this to happen? What can I do to lead change? How do I become an instrument, an ally of change within power and government, but also find those partners across the divide? And so as the ANC started to build a process with the National Party to end apartheid, they found and they saw that Rolf was an ally, that he was a partner, that he wasn't just an adversary or an enemy, but he was an instrumental partner for change. And Nelson Mandela, who's become an incredible icon. You know, this is a man who spent 27 years in prison. And in 1990, when he was getting ready to give his speech to the world, a speechwriter from the ANC gave him a draft of that speech. And when the speechwriter met, met with Nelson Mandela in the prison guest house before he was released, he saw these handwritten corrections from Nelson Mandela. And Mandela wrote about the then president of apartheid South Africa, F.W. de Klerk is an honorable man. And the speechwriter said, Madiba, which is what they called him, you can't say that. Your people don't want to hear that. They've suffered. This is our moment of liberation. You spent nearly three decades in prison. And Mandela reached across and with his hand said, no, but it is up to him to disprove it. And just, just think of that. It is up to him to disprove it. So Mandela, in that profound moment of power, not yet political power, not state power, but emotional power, moral power, and political power, used it to build a bridge, to create a space for F.W. de Klerk and other Afrikaners to cross over. And if you didn't have Rolf, and if you didn't have Mandela, and people less well-known than Nelson Mandela, saying we need to build allies and a process of change across these divides, then I don't think you would have seen apartheid end peacefully as it did in the early 1990s. And you can look in country after country of examples. A colleague and friend, Monica McWilliams, who founded with others the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, talks about being at a conference, hearing from Rolf and Sarah Ramaphosa, who is now president of South Africa, he was then the chief negotiator for the ANC in the talks to end apartheid. They said to the women in the audience in Belfast, don't rely on these men to represent you. They won't do it. We both learned that in our process. You need to get involved. And so what Monica and other women did across divides within Northern Ireland, Catholic, Protestant, independent, came together, formed the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, and actually we're at the negotiating table. 
And Monica tells the story of how she and the women were treated horribly. The most misogynist, the most sexist, the most dehumanizing language was thrown to them day in, day out. Go home. You should be having children. You should be taking care of your families and your husbands. You don't belong at this negotiating table. And day in, day out, they came to realize, as Monica would says, that those dinosaurs changed. And she said to somebody recently here in the United States, dinosaurs do change. I've seen it firsthand. And so I mention this because here we are as a m country at a moment of profound, uh, let's be honest, injustice, profound challenges, anger, systems that have been embedded, many of them unconsciously in many Americans. And people are building partnerships and allies, but they tend to be on each side. And what every country I've been in and what these leaders across the divides in those countries said, change won't happen on its own within communities. You have to build those relationships. You have to build those partnerships. And it requires that you believe not only in human agency as an instrument of change, but that humans can change. Not just your side, but the other side as well. Because without that recognition, then you won't engage. And when you don't engage, then you undermine your own agency and your own capacity for change. And I think these are profound lessons and insights we need to remember and bring home to the United States. You know, one of the themes of this TEDx event is about joy and happiness. And I remember Rolf Meyer when he was asked in the lead up to the final negotiations to end apartheid. Somebody said, how do you feel about this? And this was to somebody in his own family. He said, I feel deeply concerned. He said, on one level, I'm representing a whole community, the Africana community. And there's a lot of opposition to this. People are fearful of change. People are fearful of what's on the other side. People are fearful, are we going to be forced out of this country? Are we going to lose our homes and our farms and our livelihoods? And he said, I realized they were fearful of change because they didn't know what was on the other side. But they were also fearful because they were led to fear the other side. And he said, but I also knew in my gut that I and we were doing the right thing, that there was no going back, and that for me and others, this was going and starting to give up a mindset of superiority versus inferiority, that we're all equal in the future South Africa. And he said, the moment we signed that agreement, I never felt more joy and pleasure and relief in my life. I not only did the right thing, but my mind, my body, my soul told me I did the right thing. And the ANC today will say that the person who should have gotten the Nobel Peace Prize was Rolf Meyer. Because we recognized he was an ally. We recognized that he had integrity. And today he's a member of the African National Congress. And his former negotiating partner, Cyril Ramaphosa, is today president of South Africa. And he sends Rolf before COVID around the world to share this experience and to help other countries imagine change and to break down those barriers. So one final thing I'll say is that I learned, because we do a lot of work with brain and behavioral science, about the notion of sort of contraction and expansion. You know when you feel stressed and anxious. You literally pull in, your body pulls in. We feel that at a physiological, biological level. And that's often associated not only with fear, but with feeling misunderstood, marginalized, excluded, humiliated. But what's the opposite of that contraction? It's expansion of joy, of pleasure, of feeling understood as you see yourself, of feeling like you belong. And when I often think back and talk to some of these leaders, they say, you know, that's how we felt when we made the transition. We felt one of expansion and less of contraction. And so I want to end with that. We need to be able to step back, find allies for the causes we need to address, but also imagine that we can find allies across the other side. Thank you.